My name is Greg Bettinelli. I'm a partner at Upfront Ventures in California. I'm panicked about everything being on fire, literally and figuratively. Hey, Howard. How are you this morning? Just a day older, uh, a few more aches and pains. I forget my therapist says when someone asks me a question like that, just say fine. Yeah, this, yeah. This is like, I'm Fine, good. thanks, yeah. Canute. You? I'm great, thank you. I if you believe my that. therapist on days like that. I just want a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking Go for of it. bitch, I have a really good friend on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> He's full of segues. So it is summer, and some backdrop is in my world, the world of social leverage and the world of uh, venture capital investing, not the stock market, separate conversation. Things are on fire and I have no explanation, but I've never seen a, a moment in time where people are getting paid for just saying they're in a business. Um, hmm. And I could, and so I wanna talk about that with my guest who's uh, Greg Bettinelli. He's a really old friend and made some great introductions to me. He was an LP, took a risk on us. He was a personal LP in our first fund that had Robin Hood. We joke all the time. We've shared networks. We um, share some passions around collectibles and investing. And uh, we're only investors in one company together, Rally Road. But uh, it's been fun watching Greg work and get that company, you know, pushed forward uh, with, uh, well, we'll talk about a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. And about the role of being at a big VC firm in Los Angeles and COVID and uh, having a family. And he's also a great golfer. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I do think that my son, he, they haven't play, he hasn't played with my son in six, seven years, but I think uh, my son could take him now, but he is a good golfer. All right. And he likes the horse races which is, you know, I find interesting because one of my favorite movies was uh, about a day at the track. And we used to go to the track in, well, in Sandy, I forget the name of the place. We'd meet down there and go to the track. He'll think, remind me. I think I've been there. So it's open for like a few months of the year. It's fantastic. And people are super weird at the horse track. And I think Greg is one of those super weird guys, which is good in our business. <laughs> and funny story is, it is uh He's an LP. This is funny because it's total Greg. He, um, we don't see each other that often, but we'll, we'll hook up to play golf and really not talk about our business, which is also what I like, just talk about golf and, and stuff. And, you know, as an LP in social leverage, it was funny at the IPO of Robinhood, you know, once it, the stock kind of rocketed on the second week and he sent me a text and he goes, bought a boat. <laughs> <laughs> He's joking, but it was just funny. And then the stock went down like 20 bucks the next day. It goes, sold the boat. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, you got to have that sense of humor about all this. You know, there's real money involved with these things. But at the same time, you, know, you can't take this stuff too seriously. Uh, probably one of his, his superpowers. So anyways, it, it'll be fun to have him. We haven't had like an hour long conversation about uh, investing in uh, maybe forever, because we usually just talk about nonsense. So uh, let's get Greg in LA on the phone. You got it. Greg. Hey, Howard. Long time no group chat. I heard you wanted to bitch and banter. I would so like to I bitch and banter, because we don't do that here enough, because I, I, I'm friends with most people, but I'm not great friend. If I had all my great, great friends on, we wouldn't talk about anything except stuff we did in high school and no one would tune in except my other high school friends. And I don't want to hang out with those people. Exactly. I'm super excited because I think I was around when this podcast was born. I don't know if it was coming out of a text group we were having. It was about, or it was early March when we knew the world was ending, Yeah. but it hadn't ended yet. But the stock market was going down 5% every day. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about, God, this feels exactly like what happened in 2001 and 2009. 
and we remembered how old we were because it felt like we had lived through these every day you think it's going to go to zero and it felt like it did and then you start buying and it starts going down more and you start buying it goes down more and then you stop buying it starts going up so you start selling and it just and then you put this podcast together um, and I'm glad I'm, you know, 15 months later, I'm on. So I'm super excited. About we, that. I wanted to get to the other side cause I'm just, uh, you're an old man trapped inside a young body, even though <laughs> it's like, it's like, are you not Jewish? Are you? I'm half Jewish. My yeah, mother's Jewish. You got the wrong half. You're very, <laughs> you're very just uptight. You've got the uptight, a little bit grumpy. I'm totally attracted to it as an investor yeah. and as someone who I trust because you're not cynical otherwise you wouldn't be in the business or in la but yet you look at everything with uh a little bit uh, non well i would say non-rose colored glasses so i always get a fair take and i couldn't spend every day with you because we would never write a check for the rest of our lives right uh, right but yet here we are we've done checks together and you introduced me to a lot of my good friends in the business tell me how you came to tech in general, because I don't know the backstory. I know you were at eBay. You introduced me to Ryan yeah. Spoon. The, we met yep. at the upfront comp. Well, we knew each other. I forget how, but how do you remember it? I'm, I remember meeting you on Twitter. I was at Live Nation uh -huh. and you were an investor. We were in this food company together that was in Techstars. Oh God, Foodsy. Foodsy. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was, was a zero, o wasn't it? Ace it was yeah. um, my first. I was zero for one. Uh -huh. uh, I think it was two thousand seven, uh -huh. two thousand eight, somewhere yeah. in there. And then I think in your preamble you had mentioned the first time we met in person was at Del Mar. Uh huh. Uh, and I remember because I f forgot shoes or something, and I had to go buy some flip flops at the <laughs> uh, that, that store and my, right there. And that movie, what's a letter ride? What a great! I yes. mean, if people are yes. listening and have not watched that movie, you're not. Right you're not a connoisseur of great content. I mean, one of the classic comedy, have you seen it, Canoe? I don't know. Let It Ride is Richard Dreyfus at the peak of his yes. weird acting ability, <laughs> spending a day at the track. I don't think and I've seen it was that. a degenerate game. I mean, any kid who's trading around Wall Street bets, right. this is why I argue with the youths today. They think they know it all because right. they think they invented the internet. They think Wall Street bets is the first incarnation of social you know, they think everything's theirs. They haven't fucking watched a movie. You know what I mean? A thousand times. They don't know what I'm, you know, they came up with memes. We had, a, our memes were two hours long. Scarface was a meme, but it was the whole fucking movie. You can't get a kid to watch all of Scarface. Now they go, oh, I saw a meme, right? It's like, we had time. These kids today think they have no time, right? I can't explain it. That's true. Well, so the guy's name was Jay Trotter, if I remember. Jay Trotter. And, no, Trotter and, was the idiot friend, No. I thought it was, I, for some reason, I thought there was like this horse race right, reference. Trotter, Trotter, Trotter was his name. Trotter. And what and was the actress in that? The actress was in every movie back then, and I hated oh, her. I don't remember. But, I think, you know, I think it was, and I'm going to cheat. I know Terry Gar was Terry in Terry Gar. She used to be. Right. She would just, hey, we need a check for a comedy flick. All right, call yeah. Terry. Yeah. Hated her. Right. And, but I remember two things about that movie. One was the expression walking tall. That's where I learned the expression. Like right now, Howard, you're walking tall because what you do it if you're a racetrack and you have a really good day and you don't really trust anybody there, you put your money in your shoes. <laughs> and so the expression of walking tall is you have both feet and your feet are standing on your cash in your under your sock because you're walking tall. Yeah. Um, and that's the a, second that's a G bets line for sure. You're yep. walking tall. Uh huh. And this, the second thing, and you mentioned my, you know, a bit of, I can play both sides on opportunities, the good and the bad is his whole Richard Dreyfuss, the main character. If I remember his whole theory was he would bet on the horses that everyone else hated. Yep. So he would go around and pull everybody and cross off. And the, yeah. at the crescendo, he picks one horse that's this long shot because it was the only horse that everyone around him didn't like. And, and he I, was such a contrarian. He was that, not that, even that, just that he was a contrarian. And I was so young, so I'm so glad yeah. that I loved that movie because he was literally picking out mooshes, which is stock twist. You know, it's like people on yeah, stock twist yeah. go, why don't we kick that guy off? He's spammer. I'm like, no, that's data. We do the opposite <laughs> of, you have to know who to do the opposite of, and you have to know right. who to go with. Right. Right. Like yeah. Vegas has yeah. built their, their life, not just on the winners yes. or they understand who the mooshes are or whatever they're yeah. called. So and that, it, yeah. And it feels like right now the favorites are winning every race. 
I would just think every horse is winning. <laughs> Right. Every right. race. <laughs> hey, horse, you showed up and got out of the gate. We'll pay you. Right, right. So yeah. That's, that's my reference of everybody's on fire. Yeah, everybody's uh, on fire. So <laughs> you, you say this now, and you live in California, so it is both right. literally and figuratively. I listen to, right. I admit, I listen to the All In podcast because I like, I don't like sax on any platform other than podcast. He cracks me up because he... Yeah we share the same politics. It's like, I'll swing, man. Like if you say something stupid, I'm like on you. And we've lost that ability maybe because of the, the media, maybe because of Twitter. I don't blame one thing. I just, I think podcasts has become my fun thing from March is because I'll talk to everybody and we'll find common ground over stupidity and, and trends. And, and the trend that I'm seeing is, and I, and I have, you know, founder conversations all the time with the new founders that we have in the portfolio and, and people we're talking to. It's like, there's never been a better time to have product market fit, but there's also never been a better time to not have product market fit. <laughs> like, you know, I was talking to my friend Woody at Extend and in two years he's built a, a genius kind of mm-hmm. extended warranty product that we, we missed the investment just because of price, because I don't know, two years ago, product market fit couldn't pay up for it. Like you didn't pay up if it didn't have product market fit. And now he has product market fit and the banana, the numbers that you can get are bananas. If you don't have product market fit, it's still a good time to raise money. There's more danger attached to it because you don't have product market fit. And if you lose momentum, but are you seeing the same thing? I think you're seeing it in the categories that you might invest in. I don't think it's true in every category. Hmm. So I think in FinTech, if you have a, a, a strong team in a market that people know will someday be big. I think you get two or three shots on goal before you eventually get to a valuation that just far exceeds where you are. Um, and whether you can raise five or $50 million to do that. I think there are other categories where I think you do need to get some product market. If you're in the commerce or marketplace business, you can't get very far without having some KPIs that are showing there's some product market fit. Um, so, and I think the other side in the hard science categories, you may never show product market fit, but if the idea is big enough, you know, space has an unlimited TAM. So therefore you can raise as much money as you possibly want. Right. Yeah. Cause who knows how, we don't know how far space goes. Yeah. Right. We, we know how big the earth is, but we don't know how big space goes. So therefore my TAM could be a thousand times bigger. It could be infinite. Yeah. So there should be no, there should be no cap on valuation. And we're um, seeing that play out in a bull market. The question, I've always stayed away from space because I go, if the market turns and no, we go from, oh, the Thames Enders to like, guys, let's just put this on the back burner while I uh, put the fire out of my fucking underwear. Right. Um, but there's been no underwear fires. Even COVID didn't cause underwear fire. COVID caused us to look at each other for a month and go, ah, this really could go to zero. And then it didn't. And because it didn't go to zero, it rocketed. And yep. it really was the most fascinating moment in my investing career. And maybe it's because Knut and I were locked in a room and trying to do our public service, which was um, hiding out and not annoying people and creating more, uh, not being carriers of the disease. And I had never been in real time seen something in the market where everything had slowed down to the point where it was just me staring at a screen and no one knew anything. And the prices really were gapping down 5%. 2008, it was like, okay, if the ATMs stop working, we're fucked. Right. Here, we knew the ATMs weren't going to stop working. We just thought we'd never go outside again. And like, we had all forgotten that the technology was there to bail us out. I know there's a few of my friends that were just getting lamb along with calls and whatever, really good traders that made some good bets that I could not foresee. And, but I could not get my eyes off the screen because we were watching in digital real time, like something that we had never seen before. And I just, it was surreal. Well, a couple of things. I remember you did, you called out Zillow. I just remember you calling out Zillow very early on. And I don't know if you got that from somewhere else, but you know, I just specifically remember you were. Yeah. You know, and that was specifically in the group chat where I wasn't allowed right. to do stock posts. Like you for a right. really sm- the right. billionaire group chat. And I was like, guys, like <laughs> Zillow's a 20, like, isn't right. we supposed to be buying brands yeah. like this? So that was my only stock pick to the group. Right. And Luckily. I remember, I also remember sending you this, I have this iconic picture. I live 
in a, in a pretty cool section of San, where Santa Monica and Brentwood merge. Yep, in this area called called Brentwood Country Mart. And it, I sent you this picture. It was 3.15 on a Tuesday and just nothing. And it's this, like, I, I just, that's the one photo I distinctly remember of like, wow, this is just, everyone is literally at home. There is nobody anywhere. And this, this street is usually bustling with tourists and shoppers and locals and buses and construction workers and everything. And it was kind of just empty. And I remember that very distinctly. This is going to, I think between March 15th and 4th of July, I know for a fact I never worked harder in my life because while there was that uncertainty, I had, you know, 12, 14 company active investments in my portfolio and no one really knew what to do. I think we ended up all being wrong, most of us, um, around how bad it would be. So all these fan founders are rightfully freaked out about what they should do about headcount. Anyone who needed cash in the next 120 days, like we didn't know what to do really. So we're triaging Good across point. the portfolio. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing is, I don't remember, the PPP thing was such a clusterfuck yeah. that it was, it created all these, you didn't know if you should do it. Was it the right thing, the wrong thing? Every firm had a different view. Every, every founder thought they deserved it because um, it was free money. And then you get into moral and ethical about, well, it really wasn't for you and you're doing fine. So you can't, and just, I think that was the kickoff to a lot of the things that have now crossed over, I think, between finance and politics. And then everyone became an epidemiologist at the same time. Yes, right? That was a and quick that pivot was a, to stock expert, to epidemiologist. But they're to, the same person. Oh, So yeah. I, I think they were all related to, we didn't have anything but time other than work. And so we became, we were running our own spreadsheets about infection rates yeah. and comparing Sweden to. Well, Knut what, was know, on his like, laptop going, Ooh, look at the numbers change, right? You right, know, I remember. Right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, with all social media and stuff and those people with an audience started becoming that now they've morphed into political experts. Yeah. And stock traders. Right. Right. And so the people you've mentioned already and others, like they just have built a platform. And I used to follow some of those people on Twitter because I thought they were saying interesting things about what I do for a living. Now they've become, you know, I kind of have to mute some of it because it's all about stuff that has nothing to do with what I do for a job. Um, and I think it's all kind of kicked off and spurned uh, very interesting conversations across the board. But those are, and then the other, Howard, that I think there's what I call the second wave and not of the virus, but of, so between, I was looking back um, for a partner meeting recently, over the last five months, I have 12, let's say I have 12 active companies. Between March 15th and July 15th, 10 of my 12 companies either raised capital, sold, or went public. And the other two are raising money now. This 2021 or 2020, sorry. 21, 21. 21. So yeah, you've had a good The second work. phase, the, mm-hmm. the post, but I think this was the, a total shift where no one was saying, I'm going to go raise capital. It suddenly was everybody was doing outbound or inbound to get deals done because there was so much, there was FOMO, there's FOMO in the market. There's so much, everyone had just raised new funds and it just became this, Again, that second wave of busyness from the companies that I'd seen, I just hadn't seen that before. Um, and it all happened at one time. And I don't know, like, and I know the output, like try get a lawyer to do some work today, right? Try, like everybody is stretched and has been stretched. And it's still, usually, this is the middle of August, right? Usually this is the downtime and it definitely doesn't feel down right now. Uh, and so just the, all those things together have just created this last 18 months have just been totally on fire. And, it, you know, I don't know when it stops. Yeah, I don't know when it stops. You got to kind of just pace yourself. And I find myself some months pacing myself and other months going, what the fuck am I doing? Like, I'm, they drag me back in. I think it's the network and the relentless. It's just working whether you're working or not. So whenever you log back in, you're catching back up to just get yourself caught up and breathing so it's really a different work. You know, we don't even have an office to go to yet. We're on this rat reel of catch up. And you go for a week and go, I feel like I, I'm on, I feel like I got this in control. And then like even me this week back in Phoenix, it's like, it's my home. I feel like totally lost, uh, even though it's my home because I had a work thing going in San Diego on a desktop and now I've switched to a laptop and I'm like, <laughs> I can't get the fucking mojo going, you know? So yeah. it's all really good, but it's also just created these new dynamics mentally that I'm, that I'm struggling with. How 
is L.A. You're Mr. L.A. I mean, you called that right. You planted yourself there. You were early. You know, you, you hit yourself to, to up front, which is like the L.A. firm. Uh, Mark's an incredible marketer and capital raiser. And in L.A., you just got everything right about L.A. And then COVID really was a stinker for L.A., like Phoenix Hover was good for. for, forget why and who behaved well or just luck and weather and space and whatever. But LA was like one of my favorite places. And it's the only place I really, other than one round of golf, I haven't even come close to coming back in 18 months. Whereas I've been back to New York. Like, I feel like LA really shat the bed. Look, I, I would, you know, I'll spin it slightly different and say, you know, in the fall, late fall, early winter of 2019. So late 2019, LA got rocked by the fires. You remember? So you know those pictures. I got evacuated oh, yeah. to my house at 3:20 in the morning. You know, had to live in a hotel for a week. We ended up moving because I don't want to have to every time the wind blows, I have to worry about my house burning down. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of that was a couple months before the whole COVID thing happened. And then we had, we were a big part of the, the BLM and all of the stuff that was happening around the mini riots and the looting. And so it was pretty dire around Memorial Day of 20. That was bottom. You're locked at, you, this is before things started opening up in California. You had the election, you know, the election was starting to heat up. You had the, the looting and stuff going on in the shopping districts. I remember sitting on TV watching one of my company's goat their store called Flight Club. They just got rocked in New York. You would see, yeah, and the one in LA, you, you'd you see the red bags being oh, fuck, yeah. flying. And I remember that so distinctly. Like, that was like, oh, my God. Like, this is this is the worst. Um, and I think from then, and then the second is we've, you know, the home, the LA is a, is a microcosm, I think, of what's happening in this country where it's really a tale of two cities. And homelessness is a big problem here. And it became very visible when everyone's sitting at home and just seeing it. And it's, and, and it's still a big issue and it hasn't been solved and everybody is frustrated and rightly so. And I don't have the answers to solve it, but I think that was the image instead of the LA image of traffic escaping the city for Thanksgiving, it was pictures of the homeless people in Venice alongside the riots alongside uh, COVID. And I think that was kind of perceived to be LA as a bit of a, a shit show. Now, nothing compared to San Francisco, uh, but I think it's true. I do think L.A. at the end of the day is a huge winner in COVID. I think I know and you know many people who have now migrated to Los Angeles at an accelerated rate to start companies, to build companies. In addition, the companies that are here have just been huge beneficiaries. Of, so Snapchat's a $100 billion company, right? SpaceX is maybe a trillion dollar company someday. It's an LA company. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of just what's happened with, you know, Netflix is really based here. YouTube is really based here, Mm -hmm. even though they have technically have office. So everything that kind of entertainment, even Amazon studio. Right. And so we are, you know, you are now seeing that benefits of that, of these and the ecosystem has continued. It's been on an upward trajectory since 2009. Um, but I think that's even now an accelerated rate. And so I think long term, you know, we even struggle as a family. And I know like it's we we thought about going to do something where else. But where else am I going to go? No, I'm glad um, you did it because yeah. I love L.A., but I don't have the yeah. stomach. So here's what, it's the first time I'll say it in public. I haven't had yeah. the stomach because it's not I don't know how to solve these crises. And I'm 55. So I just want to show up and enjoy the best of LA yep. and be nice to people. But I don't have a solution for the fucking problems. Other yep. than yep. go be a good citizen, spend money and tip. Uh, yeah, other right. than that, no. I'm like, Oh, God. <laughs> like, sorry, I got I got three cities that I'm responsible for. And I can't help any of them. But I really yeah. am bullish, but don't have the stomach for LA. So I've been really yeah. thinking about Manhattan Beach. Because you know, right. I want. I'm thinking about how I spend the next 20 years. I've got great friends that just at least spend yep. half their year in LA because they should because of the weather. I have great friends in San Diego and obviously a home in Phoenix. So, to me, the most interesting place on earth right now for someone that's thinking about California is Manhattan Beach if they could afford it, of course, because there's you know some sense of security on the street. There's great food. There's the beach. 
there's if you go at weird hours, it's only a half an hour maybe to Santa Monica. What would you think from Manhattan Beach to Santa Monica? Uh, not as bad as it used to be, and very it's, it's manageable. If you come it's manageable, in the morning, right? Like so, yeah, yeah. so someone it's who's fifteen sinking, minutes from the airport, yeah, yeah. it's fine. So, so I'm so yeah. excited to have an entry yeah. point to come to LA because I do think. It's yep. too much talent there for it not to rocket ship. I think there's a delayed explosion of LA and I'm getting emails from people to imagine in Amazon because I want to spend the next 20 years making content for the, yep. so for all these years and you've been a part of it, I've been saying people are going to trade, people are going to invest. You obviously on the sports betting side and collectible side and goat and rally roll, which get into, but now yep. that it's here, there's no content for it. So I'm like, <laughs> You go to Netflix or or Amazon or Hulu, and God forbid you should search investing. Like you can go to TikTok and search investing and spend a thousand years, uh, or YouTube and search investing and spend a thousand years. You go to Hulu, or, or so let's call it just let's say you go to Netflix and search cooking, a thousand shows. You go search travel, a thousand shows. Investing is going to, you know, with Reddit and StockTwits and Twitter and Robinhood and Coinbase, you're talking about the massive and sorry goat and rally road and all the stuff that we're invested in you're talking about pretty much investing is going to touch every person on earth because of covid and because the government's printing money and basically as i have said before you know you used to be butchers in the olden days now we're investors because government just gave you money and you should just manage it so in that era la like i'm excited about making content for these hundreds of millions of new users Is GOAT fit into any of these thesis? Why, who brought you GOAT and how does that fit into what excited you and how did you come to that deal? Yeah, well, it's, it's a small world in that when I, when I went to Upfront in 2013, um, you're kind of, I think everyone who joins a, a venture capital firm is, 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 is handed a company that was probably someone else's company and one of the reasons you were hired to begin with. So you start with something to try and help make it better. Um, and at Goat, it, the company at the time was called Grub with us, Eddie and Dyson, who are still with the, the company now, um, were great founders with incredible product sense. And they just didn't get the product market fit for the core business. Um, and they had limited amounts of capital left. And one of the ideas that we were kicking around in, in some of it came from, I had spent a lot of time at eBay and had bought StubHub for eBay in 2007, I think. Um, and we were just kicking around the idea, how come there's not StubHub for sneakers? Huh. And a, a lot of my investment, I'm very basic in how I think about the consumer. I do a lot of transactional consumer investing. And one of the things I do is I, I like to go shopping. I like to drive around and go to the grocery store and go to the deli and go to the mall. And I enjoy it because it's kind of a way, so I'm not on my phone, but also I like, I study people and what they do and in particular where they line up. And it may sound really cheesy, but if you follow cues or you follow lines, you can learn a lot about market opportunities. And one of the things I noticed is that a bunch of kids were lined up outside sneaker shops on Saturday mornings. And no different than when you and I are kids, we would line up outside record shops to buy tickets for concerts because that's where they were sold in the olden days uh, before the internet. Um, and the way that sneakers are released um, is through boutique sneaker shops. Um, and these kids, sneaker heads, and not just all kids, but they would line up to buy the sneakers. And I just felt a lot like of, that's what people did when Grateful Dead or Pearl Jam would go on sale in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. It's almost the exact same and knowing enough about eBay and because I spent five plus years there and it's really the probably the most formidable years of my career. I know about friction and marketplaces and it felt like there's just some friction there and maybe someone could solve it. And Eddie and Dyson were on the same page and they solved it in a big way and a, so much bigger than anyone could ever imagine. Uh, and it's really, I just a simple thing between looking at lines of people and reading subreddits and Facebook groups, you can really find these passionate groups of enthusiasts, some good, some bad, that if you catch them before they go mainstream, they could become huge businesses. And I think finance and trading is, was always there as well. Now it's become like sports where there's celebrities and it's covered like a 
there's teams and it's become such a thing, but I think they're all somewhat related where you have these enthusiast groups that drive momentum into transactional related verticals and they kind of go crazy. And that's what's, I think a lot of commonality with these, but that's really where that, and I remember specifically saying in my investment memo that sneakers are the baseball card of the new generation. Um, and the difference between them and baseball cards is you can wear them if yeah. your player ends up sucking, right? So I can't do much with a Jack Clark rookie baseball card dating myself other than throw it against the wall and light it on fire if it turns out to be trash. But if I buy a pair, if I overpay for a pair of Nikes, I just put them on my feet and I can wear them and they're great sneakers. And so they're just this interesting, and it's turned out that that group then became, they started collecting and buying streetwear and collectibles like baseball cards and sports memorabilia and stuff like that. Like it's come back. Um, but at the time, the sneaker, the culture had always been there. And it just kind of happened that it went mainstream with Kanye West and the easy and the proliferation of, of Jordans and the fact the way that releases work where it turns out the secondary market. And this is a big thesis I have is can you find secondary markets that could be bigger than primary markets? Mm. And there's really only two in the United States where it's homes and cars are the only two uh, secondary markets that are bigger than the primary market, meaning new car sales versus used car sales or new home sales versus used home sales. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you can find categories where secondary markets can be as large potentially as primary markets, those are very interesting businesses and tickets is emerging has, it's been a 20 year run, but ticket event tickets is now like that with StubHub and all those companies. Sneakers is like that. And collectibles is definitely like that. So if you just think about the, the trading car market, mm -hmm. you know, it's maybe five to 10% of the total, the primary sales of new cards, for example, five to 10% of the market is primary, 90% is secondary. So those are super interesting because they're always fragmented and a lot of mom and pops and usually not a lot of technology, but a lot of enthusiasm and interest from the customers who participate in these verticals. And I just tend to spend time around. So sneakers and collectibles, they all mash together in that same kind of unified strategy that I have. So, so when did you invest in go what round? Cause you're a bigger fund. Well, we, so well, well, we already, we were already an investor, right? So we, we were there when it pivoted and then they raised, I remember they raised a series a, which was really, an extension to the previous round. It was just three years later. Wow. I think we I were didn't doing, know that. We were, so it was a pivot. I think we were, it was a pivot. And then you know, Robinhood was, was a pivot. It was cash cats and they'd done a social network. I didn't know it right. then. And then I saw the app and I'm like, that's the thing. Right. If I remember correctly, um, Josh Hanna from matrix led around, I want to say it was in a 20, $20 million post, which is the price of the round that up front had done a couple of years earlier. Uh -huh. We did our pro rata there. And then I think the business was doing a half a million dollars a month to give some perspective. Uh, and then six months half a later, million a month, they could raise it a billion today. Well, they could, <laughs> and they would that be, um, and then I think six months later, Excel came in at a hundred and then index at 300 and Foot Locker at 600 and D one at a billion eight and new guys at three, seven. And it's just kind of every year kind of, they, they really doubled their valuation. True, because a year um, ago when I probably last golf with you, I think it was under a billion and they were just announcing that round over a billion. Now you're saying it's over four or close to four. Yeah, it's around that. It's around that. And it just got announced about 60 days ago. It's just, and it's, it's growing faster than all of its public comps. Um, it's just amazing business. And uh, it's still early and I had nothing to do with it other than really that first couple months when we were trying to figure out what to do with the remaining cash that we had in the original business. And from there, the founders just took it and have continued to outperform expectations. The other big insight I got during that process, and I remember, I think it was someone at Spark Capital who let, who got me thinking about this. And I don't remember who it was, John or someone, was that, you know, great marketplace businesses create their own TAM. And all these investors who get scared off of marketplace business because the TAM's not big enough, they don't understand where value is created in TAM. And in marketplaces, if you unlock the friction, like an Uber, like an eBay, like an Airbnb, like a goat, if you just unlock something, it unleashes an entire new category that dwarfs what the original category was. So Uber is a great example. Right? But Uber, Uber is because of the smartphone and Google Maps. So what was it for goat? Well, goat was the fact that people didn't trust each other to buy and sell the product. And 
Who goat needed added, a middleman? Goat added an inspection process, really mm. created a managed marketplace where and guaranteed authenticity. And that unleashed the entire market is that inherently buying and selling on eBay or Craigslist or in a parking lot outside of 7-Eleven, you didn't know if you were going to be had. And inherently, consumers do not trust each other. Um, and the, one of the bigger problems with high ASP peer-to-peer -peer markets is why eBay doesn't have a large high AOV, you know, like high sales price items. Because, or Amazon they make up for it in scale, which is what I've learned right. in marketplaces. Yeah. If you sell a lot of charge, charging cords and stuff like that, you can make a lot of money because who's going to sell you a fake charger? But if you're talking about expensive trading cards or gold or dime jewelry or sneakers, there's a lot of concern that someone's going to con someone else. And by adding the authenticity and the assurance lever, and this is what happened in event tickets as well, is it unleashed the category. And you're right, there are these catalysts, and Uber was the point that just the convenience of being able to get something on demand, they're not all the same, but it, it proves that these marketplaces can unlock a lot of value. And so now when I look at marketplaces, it's all about can this secondary market be bigger than the primary? If so, even if it's a stretch to get there, that's a more exciting opportunity than one that just shifts market share. That's what feels like a lot smaller. I'm seeing it happen in stocks, right? Like obviously the transaction was what I bet on, like whoever could take that last month and got that luckily right with Robinhood, that's the trick. Now their new IPO product, I think will surprise people because I don't even think they knew how well, I mean, they took a lot of risks there, but the next layer becomes, is there something around the marketplace to like see people's portfolios or do I not care what they, I only care about ideas. I don't want to see how you manage your money. If you have a good idea, it's yep. up to me to discern what your good ideas and bad ideas are and build my own thing. So I'm, I'm a little bit unsure. Whoever unlocks that well, eToro's done that with copy right. trading. So they've proved it in the rest of the world. I haven't seen it proved in the U.S., um, but that'll take, tra you know, like, is there a goat of trading? Um, we'll see. Well, do you still believe that, and this is one of the reasons we invested in Rally, and I know you did too because you were there first, is I, I think a huge unlock is the ability to create tradable securities and things that historically weren't tradable, mm -hmm. right? And to create, because I fundamentally believe that there's liquidity, more things with more liquidity drives more value to that asset. Mm -hmm. And what are all the things that can be traded that are not? And I think one of the unlocks you had, and you, you were early, is like this idea of fractionalizing shares, yep. right? So I can buy $5 worth of something versus buy the whole stock. To me, that was a fundamental, that wasn't around. We could never do that when we were young traders, right? That I could buy a portion of a piece of a stock. Yeah, right? what, or, yeah, exactly. Well, and that was the unlock was, there was an unlock. Vanguard just didn't open up the technology. Whoever had the technology hoarded it and said, mm -hmm. we'll tell you how to use fractional shares. Buy your 500 stocks from us. If Vanguard just let other people do what Vanguard did. Like they had, they knew how to do it. They knew how to do it at scale. They just refused to let people make their own portfolios of 500 stocks. And there'd probably be no Robin Hood if Vanguard just opens up that one feature. Do stocks even split anymore? They, they are. That's how big a bubble we're in. And I say bubble. Okay. I hate saying that term, but I just, <laughs> it's such a stupid thing to do but because the market just goes up and it's at some point been politicized in that no one wants to deal with it. You don't want to get not elected because of the stock market. Cause if you can right. rig it and it's working, don't change anything. So the, everybody's just in this game, which is what made March so scary is like, we didn't have an answer for a virus and right. throwing money at a virus didn't work at first. And that's what was scary really about March is the playbook maybe was not going to work because since the long-term capital management and then the fi great financial right. crisis, whatever you call it, printing money did work, at least for getting the market going. We didn't know with a virus if money would work. And in the end it did work, but it's overcooked because these digital companies don't need the money. Right. And now you're seeing it spill out into the rest of the world. And that's caught me by surprise with Wells Fargo benefiting now and all the companies that we wish didn't benefit are benefiting. So you got these, <laughs> I, would, I would add to that. You got unintended consequences, right? Like they're running a playbook. 
in three years, they'll look back and go, see, it worked. But they're not going to take into account the fucking batshit stuff that's going on uh, with all this money floating around. Yeah, and look, the reality is these no theme that benefited from COVID wasn't already being invested in, Correct. right? Whether it's the future of, whether it's trading, whether it's Ed Zoom tech. or yeah. whatever. We were, there were firms who were all over this and either saw something or were just in the right place at the right time while others didn't. But what it did in my world, and now we're seeing on the other side, is it took marketing costs to zero. So most of the money being raised prior to that for these type of companies was into market development and market expansion. And it's in the form of sales teams and business development teams and marketing partnerships and spending money on customer acquisition, right? Think of Zoom sales team. They went from an outbound to an inbound sales team, right? Because of the fact they had to capture. Think of all the companies selling restaurant order management software. They went, they went from trying to convince small restaurants to, to do online ordering to not being able to service all the inbound requests they had. Right. And so all of that money that was budgeted for market expansion wasn't needed. And for a period of nine to 12 months, customer acquisition costs, both on the enterprise and the consumer side, were far less than they have. Now, on the consumer side, you're starting to see in the, you're starting to see earnings reports talking about, you know, I, I just saw Poshmark announce their earnings today and starting to complain about tax are increasing. Right. You're starting to see Wall Street around some of these consumer transaction businesses have concerns about whether the long term benefits of COVID. Now they're lapping really Q2 and Q3, which were very strong for many companies. And the, the reason they were so strong is customer acquisition costs went way down. And therefore, the margin profiles and unit economics of these businesses were far mm -hmm. better than they might have been. And I don't know if that's now become true in like the categories where you may play in where the, you know, the, the emerging stock trading applications or all of those businesses that, and the reality is there are very few of them that are public, right? So we may not know, um, but it's just interesting where you clearly just accelerated these markets and the companies got more efficient um, and it just accelerated, I don't know, three to five years, maybe 10 years and sometimes forward about how these markets just developed. Um, and the other thing I think people underappreciate is just how much time we usually were spending at work or traveling or driving or eating out. And we just spent all that time absorbing content and buying shit yep. or trading. Mm -hmm. And we simply, the only thing that hasn't changed post COVID is there's still only 24 hours in a day. And that is the only thing we know is going to be consistent in the future. And we can only do so much. And there was just a, such a shift of allocation of time over the past 18 months. And now there's, you know, we're not normal yet. We're getting back and you can start seeing, I think like the Olympic ratings are a great first example of total change of behavior. Like, right? I we haven't just, even tuned in for a second. Right. They're down 40% in their ratings. I thought it'd be right? worse. Right. And right. Well, still, there's a lot of old people out there who like to watch the Olympics, but in general, just you're starting to see the outputs of, even if you look at the grocery market, how Instacart has held on to a lot of share I think Shopify announced their earnings and, you know, still accelerated or, or rapid growth. And so change of behavior has been material. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, and I say stressed only because the 24 hour thing that you mentioned and that I don't know what I'm supposed to do anymore because everything worked. I right. feel lucky, but at the same time, like, what's my responsibility now? Do I tip bigger? Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm not a firefighter. Uh, right. You know, I have no skills. I'm, I'm really weak. And uh, <laughs> so it's, I feel a little bit guilty about all this stuff. So all I can do is spend time thinking about this stuff. And I'm like, the biggest thing that I see happening right now, other than what you and I talked about around fractionalization and participation and marketplaces and hooks is that I, I didn't realize what you said about costs going down. Of t I always thought it was going up because Facebook and Google, Google went through this period and I'm watching it now every day because I own the stock. And I was just like, I was scared for a while because, you know, you start believing the mantra that Amazon's taking over search and everything's becoming e-commerce. And then you start seeing Google finally catching up to everybody. And I'm like, what am I? Like, I mean, I almost got scared out of it. Like you never right. bet against Google. Now that I really think about what's going on too, when I see Goldman Sachs at all time highs and uh, Coinbase and Bitcoin at all time highs, basically, right? New companies at all yeah. time. So you got old financial institutions and new financial institutions 
and they're both working. We have two fucking, I mean, I don't think what anybody's figured out is the TAM of a completely functioning Wild West other financial market that's completely separate from the financial market that we just sprayed trillions of dollars into. The TAM of like tradable things, supply of things, not just, because if you had told me what I liked about Rally Road, Greg, at the beginning, it was like, I didn't, I liked, as much as I hate the SEC and, and regulation, I was like, what idiot would buy something that isn't, you know, so when crypto came around and everybody was like, you got to go invest in platforms that, are, that trade NFTs, or I didn't even think they were called NFTs. I'm like, no, slow down, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> we need the SEC to bless something. Or who else would trust this? So I definitely yeah. got part of it right. If you had told me that people, that the, the volume that's happening on OpenSea and Rarible and all these things where there's like completely trustless type of stuff going on for stuff that you have to buy, a, like you don't even have a wall for it. Yeah, I'm sorry. And now I'm like completely going, damn, like I get it. I still don't want to do it because I don't want to go buy a picture frame uh, you know, it's just work involved. And I don't want my computer screen to be my art screen. I don't get the whole fucking thing. And I'm not being cranky about it, but I still think the idea of, of Rally Road having the SEC blessings has been a curse and a, and a benefit because it's a curse in a world that we live in today because we don't need the, like people are fucking blowing their brains out on these platforms that have no oversight. And here are the people like Rally Road following the rules and in a way being penalized for it. I mean, this yeah. is an interesting moment and then what I, sorry, to get to my other point that I've just been mulling in my head is Google's going up because you have a separate internet, call it the decentralized one, that's going to have to acquire customers. And where are they going to go spend their money? On the centralized platforms because someone's got to aggregate the eyeballs for you to get the eyeballs onto the decentralized version. So in the end, we still need yep. Facebook and Google. And I think that's why those stocks continue to go up. Everybody's got their own story, but I'm like fascinated by like, wait a minute, OpenSea, yep. there's only so much organic growth in the end. The OpenSea is going to go spend a shit pile of money on Google and Facebook. Yep. I think it's right. I, I kind of, I'm with you a little bit. And this is you, you opened with my kind of, I can look at things slightly from a negative side. I kind of use the, the casino analogy where I feel like there's a group of people who are inside a casino and they're just moving their chips from one table to the next. Mm -hmm. And they go from, you know, NBA top shop to this, to that. And I get all the infrastructure being built and I think it's amazing. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all kind of related to what's happened in crypto. It's all related to what's happened in the run up of these, these digital assets and they're just moving them around because they continue to increase in value. Mm -hmm. And so they're not cashing out. They're not taking the chips and going to the cashier and then go buying something no, else. No, they've invented a new term called APE and I'm getting abused right. on my own site that I created because I'm really think it's a bad term. I mean, I'm not saying I'm open to new ideas. It's like an APE is supposedly <laughs> just dumb like an APE. Not, he, not quite human, meaning they want to just yeah. To, they'll ride it into the ground to prove a point. And I'm like, yeah, that is yeah. not investing. That's stupidity. Yeah. yeah. And look, I think the current view of the regulators and I are rightly so is if you're going to fractionalize something, it needs to be regulated. And I think that's what you're hearing loud and clear. If you and I buy and sell things at a hundred percent to each other, it's no problem. Yeah. But if you begin to fractionalize it and spread it across a group, there needs to be a regulatory framework that works it. It needs to have less friction than it currently does. I think it's it's better now than it's ever been. It's got a long way to go, but it can't be just wide open because there's going to be some losers. And to your point, when you lose money and a lot of it, a lot of other things happen besides just losing money. Like there are real downstream effects that involve personal people's lives and create all sorts of things that we don't want to have to deal with. And I think the government's view, um, regardless if you're Democrat or Republican, I think is that there there needs to be some sort of regulatory framework around that fractionalization. And I think that's what you see and you know our experience with rally and others would signify that. And I think there's a big fight going on right now in regards to the role that government's going to have because um, these you know from a taxation perspective and stuff, we all know there's you know we're not it's not fully monetized on the government side. They know that too. and I think this is an opportunity for them to kind of get their hands on some of that and there's a natural, kind of adverse reaction to that by a lot of people in the community, for sure.
you and I know what we know about each other and you know what I like, I know what you like, you know, besides the stuff that we have in common, what are you super excited about at Upfront that you're working on? That's a cool company that I might not have heard of, or is it an e-commerce or what, like, what are you super excited about besides the winners that you already have? No, look, I have, I, there, I have some commonalities and I, I really like these, you know, I write two to five million dollar lead checks in interesting transactional and consumer services businesses. It's kind of what I do. And if I look back at what I've done well over the past six or seven years, plus what I did well as, as an operator prior to that, it's really my sweet spot. And finding those opportunities in those transactional businesses or consumer services businesses that I believe are underserved and create a lot of things and do so by leveraging things like community, enthusiasm, vertical, just nature. I like to be able, using a sports analogy, I like to identify companies that can get to first or second base on the demand or the supply side without having to spend a ton of marketing dollars to do so. Mm. I find out this doesn't mean that you can't do it this way, but I look for recurring purchases. I look for a sense of the ability for the company to get some scale without having to Google or Facebook a bunch of money. Right. And those are really attractive to me. And I think predominantly those are the businesses that I think can create special value because they tend to have legs that are longer. You don't spend your more board meetings talking about the increase of CPAs at Facebook and Google. So what are the areas like those are things that I, I spend time. I use a lot of existing businesses to identify other businesses like for like. Um, like I'm fascinated. I think it was our friend, Scott Marlette, who told me about, uh, the business, uh, bring a trailer. Do you know that business? Yeah. Right. I love the idea of using storytelling to convince people to buy things they didn't know they wanted. And I've had a lot of success in my career, a company called Hope Look that I was part of prior to, we sold it to Nordstrom, which is how I got into VC is we had these flash sales every day. And you get this email at eight o'clock in the morning and said, here's the five brands we have today. And you didn't know what was coming every day and everyone would buy a bunch of stuff, even though they didn't know it was coming, it didn't need it. Um, and if you can convince people to buy things they didn't know they need, finding irrational consumers or irrational business buyers can be really big business. So I like to look at, you know, what are the ways you can use content and community to sell things you didn't know you could sell. I think there's also a lot of things happening around verticalization, whether it's, you know, around vacations or fitness or, these areas where, again, these communities and enthusiasts are aggregating and there's a lot of verticalization, no different than, say, Brex would be, is really a vertical credit card and credit offering, right? You could argue even there's verticalization within trading. You're seeing that at all facets. Um, so that's super interesting to me. And I've also been, you know, a lot of this is, I think you might have even shared, like, you really follow where smart people are, mm -hmm. right? Like, you've been very good and public about, hey, I'm, there are people who know more than I do. And if I learn what they're doing, I can put my own spin on it. And I think climate is becoming that for me. Mm. Um, there is so much smart money going, but right now it's primarily at the high, like the big funds, but there is so much innovation happening. It, clearly, I talked about fire literally and figuratively. There's so much happening around how consumers or businesses are changing their behaviors because of climate that that feels like a super interesting entry point for me to kind of go to my next space. I'll keep doing what I'm doing, but there's, there's some things there that I think are varied. And I'm not talking about desalination or, you know, that kind of stuff, but just more software enabled businesses that touch the conscious customer or the conscious business around climate. Um, those are interesting things to me. And so, those are, you know, again, I'm, I'm very founder driven. I react to finding great teams with unique, really what I call founder market fit. But I do have these kind of areas of, of focus where I'll spend more time than others. And what is it that you, I mean, I think that's great. That helps me a lot. We have to do more stuff together because there is overlap. What, so what is it also about golf that has you hooked? Yeah. And look, I have to be mindful. We are, ex we're extraordinarily lucky to be able to play golf, right? Yeah. We have jobs where we have flexibility. It is not a cheap sport. Like I recognize that I've been playing golf since I was 10 years old. Um, and golf was the first thing I was better at than all my friends. And that's why I played golf. I looking back like reverse engineering, I was a pretty good baseball player, but I wasn't great. I didn't, 
I could, you know, play second base. I didn't have any power. I was pretty good, but I wasn't great. I was too short to play a good basketball player. I was too slow to be a good football player, but I was a pretty good golfer. Um, and I played it. And while my other friends played baseball and football and basketball, I played golf and I was pretty good on the high school team. And I just always played a little bit. So as you know, if you play, it's like riding a bike. When you do something when you're a kid, it's so much easier than if you start when you're older. And so I've always kind of, kind of have a legs up and I like that. The second is I don't spend a lot of time on my Peloton. I'm not a big go to the gym and, you know, I'm not a big hiker, but Nellie's don't hike. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to play golf cause I can walk, you know, it's a six mile, seven minute mile walk and I don't get to do that very much. And so I like that. And the other thing is I, to your point, you made a comment. I don't like to talk about work as much as I probably should. Right. And but I can still learn a lot about a person on the golf course, even though I'm not talking about work. I feel if I get you on a golf course for four hours, you I don't need me. to ever. I know whether we're one and the same. I know whether we're never going to have lunch together again. I know your mannerisms. I know if you're polite. I know if you say good shot. I know if you fix your ball mark. I know if you play out of turn. I know if you talk on the phone, on the whole, you know, all the things that there's this kind of unwritten and written rules. You learn a lot about a person when you're in the car with them or playing golf with them or having dinner with them. And golf's just one of those things I do. Um, and it turns out more people do it than I thought. And so there's actually a lot of people who play golf and I think it, golf's been a huge beneficiary of, uh, of COVID, but I don't play golf when I'm on vacation with my family. And yeah, neither do I. Right. And so it's just, and you know, I guess it's kind of my thing. I think like trading golf is the hardest thing to do. Uh, Cause there's so many movements. It's very three dimensional. And so is investing, like you're competing against everybody. There's no right way to do it. Uh, There's a million swings, you know, at impact, everybody looks the same, just like a a good trade. You know, you can play the tape back and you did the right things. Um, But Instagram, I have found has taken, I am getting so much consumable, digestible tips and ideas. Uh, I was playing with one Don who works with me and he doesn't get to play that often. And a swing is perfect. And I said, how did you do that? He goes, YouTube and Instagram. Like, wow, interesting. So I believe that you don't have to have access to as much money. The game becomes enjoyable to this many more people because of Instagram and YouTube, because it's the three dimension part of the education part, much like trading. So I think golf, and I've seen this with G4, I think they're doing it pretty well with the way they're rolling up. I think there's going to be a million other ways uh, between fashion and technology that make golf a much bigger sport. And I think a lot of the stuff around golf will change, but I mean, the, the participation rates are so high. So I'm more looking at it from an investing standpoint. So has that crossed your mind at all? Well, I've always, you know, I always been a little concerned about golf's TAM from a venture capital perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, I think top golf is an amazing business, right? That wouldn't really be even Yeah. And that brought Callaway back from the debt. Right. It's really not a venture. It's more of a private equity type of business because it's got a lot of real estate and things like that. I think there are the simulator stuff. Like, I agree. It, there is interest. I've looked at this stuff. I think it would be probably difficult to convince my partners that there's a big golf opportunity. I think, you know, you always like, what would be the Peloton for golf, right? Where you're competing against each other in a simulator in your garage or at a bar and you have hole in one competitions. And there's some interesting ideas. I have, oh, I have literally have a list of 50 golf ideas. Um, that I've aggregated or thought of myself, I just would struggle. Like it's almost, I try not to mix business and pleasure. Um, and so I think collectibles is, and sports is about as far as I can cross. So I have moved and did a golf investment. I don't. Yeah. Think I think I got lucky with golf now. Cause that was the yeah. one area like reservations yeah. and it's still only sold for, I mean, obviously it was yeah. a great acquisition by Comcast, but we only sold for 40 million back, but it was in my world, that was a home run back then. Yeah. But in hindsight, we shouldn't have sold it. But I really think there's something there around, and I agree with you, hobbies should not be investments. I've lost a lot of money in comedy, and <laughs> and I've been pitched a lot of golf deal, and smartly I've said no, but I'm starting to come around. After seeing G4 build yeah. a fashion brand in some way on right. Instagram, I believe there's something in this industry that people are missing. So, Oh, just, I agree. Look, G4 was started in our na- in our neighborhood, yeah. literally. As you know, the founder, Massimo, yeah. like he's more infamous now. But he started G4. Um, and Travis Matthew is another brand. I love Travis others. Matthews. I can't believe I'm wearing the guy's logo. I mean, he's not even at the company. You <laughs> know, know what I mean? Like he blew yeah. his own deal. <laughs> um, that's right. I think you like golf. So you have a very good swing. And I think you're just good enough 
and you you have your swing will last forever. It's a very smooth. You're like Nolan Ryan. You can pitch as long as you want to pitch because it doesn't hurt your body and you just have a very flow swing. I think your son does too. And it's fun to have someone in your family who's good too, because it keeps you motivated. Yeah. And it's, you know, as you guys get older, that's going to be a thing you can always do together. And there's some, that's what's special about golf too. You know, I've made, you know, COVID to me has been about simplifying things to the benefit is I got to spend a lot more time with my family, not just my kids and my wife here, but my dad and I made a couple trips. We went to band, we went to Oregon, we drove 12 hours. Like I haven't been in a car with my dad for 12 hours each way ever. Mm -hmm. Right. And just being able to use golf as the connective tissue to spend time together. It's about more than just what your score is. Um, And that's what I think. And everyone has their hobbies that do that. But for me, that's how I use it. And um, I do think it is one of those sports. Technology has changed it, but only really on the hardware side so far. Correct. Um, Not so much on the the software side. Um, And so something about this Instagram really some incredibly young kids doing amazing education. Yeah. Uh, I want to learn how to hit, you know, those shots they show where they, those kids hit those low liners. Yeah. Like the right. Stinger. I want to learn how to do that. Yeah. Um, the stingers, you know, I don't know how many takes it takes, but that would be amazing. <laughs> so I really appreciate the uh, time. That was fun to truly catch up. I, I agree with you. Golf is off the list. It's just something that uh, as an angel, I'm going to continue to poke around it. But you, you have to write two to $5 million checks and Tam really, as much as we hate saying it, Tam does matter. And, you know, oh, absolutely. hopefully we're surprised and you, and you right. kick yourself and say, God damn it. I, I can't believe I right. said the Tam was too small, but it's, you can't you can't make those bets at that size if there's not a right. true belief of the TAM. So uh, yeah. keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for uh, coming on. Hopefully, I'll see you up in LA soon. All right, Howard. It's always great to talk, and um, happy to be helpful if I ever can. It's good to hear you in a positive light, and I'm glad everything's gone so well for you. All right, buddy. Talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Talk soon. Bye. There you have it, Greg. A gentleman VC. Absolutely. The grumpy gentleman. I, I, I'm a little scared around Greg sometimes. <laughs> but uh, it's a good scared because it's yeah. just like you know what you're getting all the time. You know, it's consistent. And that's what I like about well, everything that I do, the people I hang out with. I need some consistency. Mm-hmm. The internet gives me the madness that I need. So uh, thanks for doing that, Greg. Uh, Knute, good to see you. This is uh, Panic with Friends. We sit down with venture capitalists, investors, traders, entrepreneurs, try and just see some playbooks, help people get uh, maybe one or two steps ahead. And uh, we do this once a week. You can search the archive, go to Spotify, Google, Apple, subscribe, search my name, Howard Lindzen. You'll get one a week. We release them on Thursdays. And uh, so I appreciate you tuning in. Tell your friends and we'll see you next week. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or Stock Twits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. Uh, the business, uh, bring a trailer. Do you know that business? Yeah. Right. I love the idea of using storytelling to convince people to buy things they didn't know they wanted. And I've had a lot of success in my career, a company called Hope Look that I was part of prior to, we sold it to Nordstrom, which is how I got into VC is we had these flash sales every day and you get this email at eight o'clock in the morning and said, here's the five brands we have today. And you didn't know what was coming every day and everyone would buy a bunch of stuff, even though they didn't know it was coming, they didn't need it. Um, and if you can convince people to buy things they didn't know they need, finding irrational consumers or irrational business buyers can be really big business. So I like to look at, you know, what are the ways you can use content and community to sell things you didn't know you could sell. I think there's also a lot of things happening around verticalization whether it's, you know, around vacations or fitness or these areas where, again, these communities and enthusiasts are aggregating and there's a lot of verticalization, no different than, say, Brex would be is really a vertical credit card and credit offering, right? You could argue even there's verticalization within trading. You're seeing that at all facets. Um, so that's super interesting to me. And I've also been, you know, a lot of this is, I think you might have even shared, like, you really follow where smart people are. 
mm-hmm. right? Like you've been very good and public about, hey, I'm, there are people who know more than I do. And if I learn what they're doing, I can put my own spin on it. And I think climate is becoming that for me. Mm. Um, there is so much smart money going, but right now it's primarily at the high, like the big funds, but there is so much innovation happening. It, clearly, I talked about fire literally and figuratively. There's so much happening around how consumers or businesses are changing their behaviors because of climate that that feels like a super interesting entry point for me to kind of go to my next space. I'll keep doing what I'm doing, but there's, there's some things there that I think are varied. And I'm not talking about desalination or you know, that kind of stuff, but just more software enabled businesses that touch the conscious customer or the conscious business around climate. Um, those are interesting things to me. And so those are, you know, again, I'm, I'm very founder driven. I react to finding great teams with unique, really what I call founder market fit, but I do have these kind of areas of, of focus where I'll spend more time than others. And what is it that you, I mean, I think that's great. That helps me a lot. We have to do more stuff together because there is overlap. What, so what is it also about golf that has you hooked? Yeah. And look, I have to be mindful. We are, ex, we're extraordinarily lucky to be able to play golf, right? Yeah. We have jobs where we have flexibility. It is not a cheap sport. Like I recognize that I've been playing golf since I was 10 years old. Um, and golf was the first thing I was better at than all my friends. And that's why I played golf. I, looking back, like reverse engineering, I was a pretty good baseball player, but I wasn't great. I, did, I could, you know, play second base. I didn't have any power. I was pretty good, but I wasn't great. I was too short to play a good basketball player. I was too slow to be a good football player, but I was a pretty good golf. Um, and I played it while my other friends played baseball and football and basketball. I played golf and I was pretty good on the high school team. And I just always played a little bit. So as you know, if you play, it's like riding a bike. When you do something when you're a kid, it's so much easier than if you start when you're older. And so I've always kind of, kind of a legs up. And I like that. The second is I don't spend a lot of time on my Peloton. I'm not a big go to the gym and, you know, I'm not a big hiker. Bet Nellie's don't hike. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to play golf because I can walk, you know, it's a six mile, seven minute mile walk. And I don't get to do that very much. And so I like that. And the other thing is, I, to your point, you made a comment. I don't like to talk about work as much as I probably should, right? And, but I can still learn a lot about a person on the golf course, even though I'm not talking about work. I feel if I get you on a golf course for four hours, you I don't need me. to ever, I know whether we're one and the same, I know whether we're never going to have lunch together again. I know your mannerisms. I know if you're polite. I know if you say good shot. I know if you fix your ball mark. I know if you play out of turn. I know if you talk on the phone, on the whole, you know, all the things that there's this kind of unwritten and written rules, you learn a lot about a person when you're in the car with them or playing golf with them or having dinner with them. And golf is one of those things I do. Um, and it turns out more people do it than I thought. And so there's actually a lot of people who play golf. And I think it, golf's been a huge beneficiary of, uh, of COVID. But I don't play golf when I'm on vacation with my family. Yeah, neither do I. Right. And so it's just, and, you know, I guess it's kind of my thing. I think like trading, golf is the hardest thing to do because uh, there's so many movements. It's very three-dimensional and so is investing. Like you're competing against yep. everybody. There's no right way to do it. Uh, there's a million swings, you know, at impact, everybody looks the same, just like a, a good trade. You know, you can yep. play the tape back and it was for, you did the right things. Um, but Instagram, I have found has taken, I am getting so much consumable, digestible tips and ideas. Uh, I was playing with one Don who works with me and he doesn't get to play that often. And a swing is perfect. And I said, how did you do that? He goes, YouTube and Instagram. Like, wow. Interesting. So I believe that you don't have to have access to as much money. The game becomes enjoyable to this many more people because of Instagram and YouTube, because it's the three dimension part of the education part, much like trading. So I think golf, and I've seen this with G4, I think they're doing it pretty well with the way they're rolling up. I think there's going to be a million other ways uh, between fashion and technology that make golf a much bigger sport. And I think a lot of the stuff around golf will change, but I mean, the, the participation rates are so high. So I'm more looking at it from an investing standpoint. So has that crossed your mind at all? Well, I've always, you know, I always been a little concerned about golf's TAM from a venture capital perspective. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think Top Golf is an amazing business, right? That wouldn't really be even f- yeah, and that brought Callaway back from the dead. Right. It's really not a venture. It's more of a private equity type of business because it's got a lot of real estate and things like that. I think there are the simulator stuff. Like I agree, it, there is interest. I've looked at this stuff. I think it would be probably difficult to convince my partners that there's a big golf opportunity. I think you know you always like what would be the peloton for golf, right? Where you're competing against each other in a simulator in your garage or at a bar and you have hole in one competitions. And there's some interesting ideas. I have, oh, I have literally have a list of 50 golf ideas um, that I've aggregated or thought of myself. I just would struggle. Like it's almost, I try not to mix business and pleasure. Um, and so I think collectibles is, and sports is about as far as I can cross. And I've moved into the golf investment. I don't. Yeah. I think I got lucky with golf now because that was the yep. one area like reservations yep. and it's still only sold for, I mean, obviously it was yep. a great acquisition by Comcast, but we only sold for 40 million back, but it was in my world, that was a home run back then. Yep. But in hindsight, we shouldn't have sold it. But I really think there's something there around, and I agree with you. Hobbies should not be investments. I've lost a lot of money in comedy. And, <laughs> and I've been pitched a lot of golf deal and smartly I've said no, but I'm starting to come around after seeing G4 builds yeah. a fashion brand in some way on right. Instagram. I believe there's something in this industry that people are missing. So, Oh, I agree. Look, G4 was started in our na- in our name, yeah. literally, as you know, the founder Massimo, yeah. like he's more infamous now, but he started G4. Um, and Travis Matthew is another brand. I love Travis others. Matthews. I can't believe I'm wearing the guy's logo. I mean, he's not even at the company. You <laughs> know, know what I mean? Like he is. blew yeah. his own deal. <laughs> um, that's right. I think you like golf. So you have a very good swing and I think you're just good enough and you, you have your swing will last forever. It's a very smooth, you're like Nolan Ryan. You can pitch as long as you want to pitch because it doesn't hurt your body and you just have a very flow swing. And I think your son does too. And it's fun to have, someone in your family who's good too, because it keeps you motivated. Yeah. And it's, and as you guys get older, that's going to be a thing you can always do together. And there's some, that's what's special about golf too. You know, I've made, you know, COVID to me has been about simplifying things to the benefit is I got to spend a lot more time with my family, not just my kids and my wife here, but it, my dad and I made a couple trips. We went to band, we went to Oregon, we drove 12 hours. Like I haven't been in a car with my dad for 12 hours each way ever. Mm-hmm. Right. And just being able to use golf as the connective tissue to spend time together. It's about more than just what your score is. Yep. Um, and that's what I think. And everyone has their hobbies that do that. But for me, that's how I use it. And um, I do think it is one of those sports. Technology has changed it, but only really on the hardware side so far. Correct. Um, not so much on the, the software side. Um, and so yeah, something about really- this Instagram really some incredibly young kids doing amazing education. Yeah. Uh, I want to learn how to hit, you know, those shots they show where they, those kids hit those low liners. Yeah. Like the right. I want to learn how to do that. Yeah. Um, the stingers, you know, I don't know how many takes it takes, but that would be amazing. <laughs> so I really appreciate the uh, time. That was fun to truly catch up. I, I agree with you. Golf is off the list. It's just something that uh, as an angel, I'm going to continue to poke around it. But you, you have to write two to five million dollar checks. And Tam really, as much as we hate saying it, Tam does matter. And, you know, oh, absolutely. hopefully we're surprised and you, and you yeah. kick yourself and say, God damn it. I, I can't believe I All said right. the Tam was too small, but it's. You can't, you can't make those bets at that size if there's not a right. true belief of the TAM. So uh, yeah. keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for uh, coming on. Hopefully I'll see you up in L.A. soon. All right, Howard. It's always great to talk and i um, happy to be helpful if I ever can. It's good to hear you in a positive light, and I'm glad everything's gone so well for you. All right, buddy. Talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Talk soon. Bye. There you have it, Greg. A gentleman VC. Absolutely. The grumpy gentleman. I, I, I'm a little scared around Greg sometimes. <laughs> but it's a good scared because it's just like, you know what you're getting all the time. You know, it's consistent. And that's what I like about well, everything that I do, the people I hang out with. I need some consistency. Mm-hmm. The internet gives me the madness that I need. So uh, thanks for doing that, Greg. Uh, Knut, good to see you. This is uh, Panic with Friends. We sit down with venture capitalists, investors, traders, entrepreneurs, try and just see some playbooks, help people get uh, maybe one or two steps ahead. And uh, we do this once a week. You can search the archive, go to Spotify, Google, Apple, subscribe, search my name, Howard Lindzen. You'll get one a week. We release them on Thursdays. 
And uh, so I appreciate you tuning in. Tell your friends, and we'll see you next week. Howard Linson is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or Stock Twits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. Saying it, Tamp does matter. And, you know, oh, absolutely. hopefully we're surprised and you, and you yeah. kick yourself and say, God damn it, I, I can't believe I right. said the Tam was too small. But it's, you, can't, you can't make those bets at that size if there's not a right. true belief of the Tam. So uh, yeah. keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for uh, coming on. Hopefully I'll see you up in L.A. soon. All right, Howard. It's always great to talk and i um, happy to be helpful if I ever can. It's good to hear you in a positive light, and I'm glad everything's gone so well for you. All right, buddy. Talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Talk soon. Bye. There you have it, Greg. A gentleman VC. Absolutely. A grumpy gentleman. I, I, I'm a little scared around Greg sometimes. <laughs> but uh, it's a good scared because it's yeah. just like you know what you're getting all the time. You know, it's consistent. And that's what I like about everything that I do, the people I hang out with, I need some consistency. Mm -hmm. The internet gives me the madness that I need. So uh, thanks for doing that, Greg. Uh, Canute, good to see you. This is uh, Panic with Friends. We sit down with venture capitalists, investors, traders, entrepreneurs, try and just see some playbooks, help people get uh, maybe one or two steps ahead. And uh, we do this once a week. You can search the archive, go to Spotify, Google, Apple, subscribe. Search my name, Howard Lindzen. You'll get one a week. We release them on Thursdays. And uh, so I appreciate you tuning in. Tell your friends, and we'll see you next week. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or Stock Twits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. And podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of social leverage or stock twits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. Podcast.